to talk about how the zebra swallow tail disappeared from Pittsburgh. The zebra swallow tail is a very beautiful butterfly that disappeared from Pittsburgh. It is in the kite family of swallowtail, which is the only one in North America. It's black and white like a zebra and it's really pretty. Anyway, uh, it came to our area via its host, the pawpaw tree, which traveled from the tropics, carried by various megafauna back in the day. It took a while to come thousands, millions of years, I don't know, a long time. Uh, basically, we're talking about, man, I gotta nix a lot of these extra words I'm using. The giant ground sloth is one. It's this big ass sloth, closely closest related to the two-toed sloth, um, and was as big as well, some of them were as big as elephants. Um, the ones that made it up to here were about, I guess, like 10 feet long. Thomas Jefferson was kind of obsessed with them because he found fossils of them and thought that they might be around. In fact, when Lewis and Clark were getting ready to make their expedition, he asked them to look for giant ground sloths. Uh, they didn't find them. Um, in addition to the giant ground sloths are the mastodons, which are related to the mammoths, but the difference with the mastodons is that they lived more in swampy valleys and forests. And I, the, the ground sloths actually um, had a different range of things depending on the species, but there is one that definitely hung out in the valleys, much like the uh, the mastodons, and that's where the pawpaws grew. They would grow in wet, forested valleys. And uh, there's also the short-faced bear, which we think also may have been a consumer of the pawpaw. And the reason why we think that these creatures ate them is because pawpaws have large fruit, and the large fruit has very large seeds. Um, I think silver dollar sized. Um, really, I should have some <laughs> seeds in my hand. I've got some, but I just, I'm just, okay. In my final version of this, I will be holding pawpaw seeds, so you will see. Um, they would consume the fruit and poop out the seeds where they wandered around, and it was largely in valleys. I mean, they, they do grow in some hilltops, but not... Not very far from water, in my experience, usually more in creek beds because uh, the pawpaw's seeds need to stay quite moist to germinate. And um, when the pawpaw spread, so did the zebra swallowtails, which also had uh, tropical roots, but uh, they managed to make it up here with all that company and they just had a great time. <laughs> now, about 30,000 years ago, uh, probably more, the First Nations, that is the first people, came over and uh, they started spreading throughout the Americas and eventually they became pretty widespread. So about 15 to 8,000 years ago was the Quaternary Extinction Event in the late Pleistocene during which a lot of megafauna died, and that includes the giant ground sloth, the mastodon, the mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger, the short-faced bear, and um, some other guys that I'm forgetting about. But the pawpaws still did well. Um, first of all, I don't think that the First Nations people disturbed them too much. They were into agriculture and are responsible for us having great things like corn and potatoes and tomatoes and chocolate and some other things, sunflowers, but okay, that's enough on that. Um, they probably also cultivated some pawpaws because they, they got into a lot of things. I mean, they, they 
cultivated turkeys. They actually had pet dogs and stuff, though. They ate them somewhat. I mean, other cultures have eaten dogs, too. Um, well, anyway, uh, things are going all right for the pawpaws and the people and the butterflies. And then the white people came. And uh, they were terrible for the First Nations people. Don't need to expand on that. Um, anyhow, um, I just thought I'd have a little story in here which relates to pawpaws and the giant ground sloths. Um, I mentioned before that Thomas Jefferson was kind of obsessed with them and he was hoping that Lewis and Clark would bring home some giant ground sloths or something, which they didn't, but they did end up in a situation where they ran out of food and they had nothing to eat but pawpaws, which were probably a staple of the giant ground sloth. So that's kind of fun. It was like, I think it was like, I ate them for 10 days straight before they got some food otherwise. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about what the white people did, but I think I need to go back to the habitat and the life cycle of the pawpaw to explain why what happened next is important and why it really is why the zebra swallowtail has disappeared from the Pittsburgh area. And okay, that's that's the habitat and life cycle. I, I said before that they tend to grow in forested areas close to water, along creek lines and rivers. Um, what I'm going to talk about after this is industry and how it negatively impacted the pawpaw trees and thus the zebra swallowtails. So the places where pawpaws grow in the river valleys and along creeks and waterways but I mean, they don't actually like to grow in swamps. They, they, they don't like wet feet. Are perfect areas for industries of all sorts. And uh, so I'm gonna talk more about pawpaws and why once these areas got kind of, kind of kicked out the pawpaws, um, it was harder for them to come back. It, and that's because of the manner in which pawpaws reproduce. They are protogenous, which is to say that the <clears throat> their flowers have the two genders, but the female parts of the flower matures before the male part. Um, to make this kind of make sense, let's just pretend that you we as a species were the same way. So what that would mean is that we all start out as kids and then we hit puberty and instead of like turning into a man or woman, we all develop mature uteruses. And we'll just say that we're all of legal age. We're like, you know, 18 years old. <laughs> but if we wanna have a baby that year, and I'm, I'm going to pretend, too, that we go through this cycle once a year, every year, okay? Just just to make it more like the pawpaws, because that's what happens with them. Though, in their case, it takes them, oh, probably five, five to ten years. I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing. It's It depends. It depends on the circumstances before they can produce fruit. Um, but just pretend that you started out being female, and if you wanted to have a baby, you'd have to find a man quick. And the man would be somebody just like you, who was a little bit later in their season. <laughs> because eventually your female parts, they either are gonna get knocked up, you're either gonna produce some kind of fruit, or there's gonna be nothing there. But all is not lost because all of a sudden you have male organs that are mature and so you're going to go out and try to find somebody younger than you in the season to impregnate and you could be pregnant and still impregnate somebody isn't that fun that would be a good science fiction story um anyway the 
papa is much the same. And that, oh yeah, let me just note one more thing. Um, <laughs> if for some reason you matured both male and female, you could impregnate yourself. And that wouldn't be very good, right? You don't want you don't want to knock yourself up. That's inbreeding. That's something that we don't want to do. And that's kind of what happens with pawpaws. They do not um, self-pollinate because of the way the flowers mature. Um, but anyway, if you miss out this year, next year you have a chance at the same thing. <laughs> so that's that's how um, pawpaw reproduction works. And uh, that's one reason why when industry came through and started isolating pawpaws, it became harder for them to reproduce. So I'm going to stop on that now and talk about the Industrial Revolution. All right, I'm going to stop recording now. That's a good one.